Our New Testament reading comes from the letter to the Philippians. If you would stand for the reading of God's word, Philippians chapter 3. Beginning at verse 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law blameless. But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have a apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Turning your copy of God's Word now to Genesis. Continue our study there this morning. In chapter 47, which you pick up in verse 13 and read to the end of the chapter. If you remember, Joseph's family has come now to Egypt and been settled in Goshen. And the famine continues. Let's give our attention to God's word. Now there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. So when the money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us bread. For why should we die in your presence? For the money has failed. And Joseph said, Give your livestock, and I will give you bread for your livestock if the money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the cattle of herds, and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year had ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is gone. My Lord also has our herds of livestock. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread. And we in our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. 
And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every man of the Egyptians sold his field, because the famine was severe upon them. So the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he moved them into the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other end. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh, and they ate their rations which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their land. And Joseph said to the people, Indeed, I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And it came to pass in the harvest, and it shall come to pass in the harvest, that you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh. Four-fifths shall be your own as seed for the fields and for your food, for those of your households, and as food for your little ones. So they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day that Pharaoh should have one-fifth, except for the land of the priests only, which did not become Pharaoh. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen. And they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Now if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my father. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. He said, I will do as you have said. Then he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. So Israel bowed himself on the head of the bed. As far in the reading of God's word. Amen. Please be seated. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, now we come and seek We seek your face. We ask, Lord God, that you would, by your Spirit, illumine our hearts. That you would, Father, give us all that you have this morning from this, your very word. Work powerfully in us. Make us more like Christ. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus gave his disciples and those who were listening many, many parables. Two of them, two of them really are the same, and this would be the parable of that hidden treasure in the field and the parable of the great pearl. If you remember what Jesus was doing, he was teaching his disciples about the kingdom of heaven, what it was like. The kingdom of heaven was like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he went and sold all that he had to buy the field. Similarly with the pearl, The merchant was seeking beautiful pearls, and when he had found one of great price, he sold everything that he had to buy it. Similar parable. Both men were searching, both men were seeking that which they did not yet possess. And when they found it, when they came upon it, what did they do? sold everything. Nothing that was in their possession had any value any longer. They never gave those things that were in their possession a second thought. Out of hand, out of mind, they had that which was of great value, either the treasure hidden or the pearl. 
Only one thing was of value. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. I think we have something similar today in this passage in, in Genesis. As, as now, uh, the focus, or at least the geographic focus, of Genesis 37 through 50 has really been on the land of Egypt. Almost all of the narratives so far have been taking place in Egypt. Joseph was sold off into Egypt, while uh, while the family was caught in sin, Joseph was suffering in Egypt where he was being brought closer to the Lord. Joseph interprets dreams in Egypt. He is raised as second in command. Where in Egypt, that survival center, he tests his brothers in Egypt. And now, the generations of Joseph have all moved into Egypt. As we consider this passage today, I would ask that you think that as the Spirit works, worldly lusts are left behind, and the faithful reach forward to those things which are ahead. See that in three points. Three simple points this morning for getting hunger, for getting worldly things, and then for getting desolation. Well, first, for getting hunger. As this passage opens, verse 13 in chapter 47, there's a harsh description of what's going on in Egypt, the severity of the famine. Look at verse 13. The famine was very severe. So the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. That word languished, as far as Webster's is concerned, it means to lose strength, to be spiritless, to grow heavy, to wither, to grow dull. No longer active or vigorous, that's what that word means languished. That's a description of the land, the whole land. Obviously, it's a description of the people in the land. And, and then the perception of the people, verse 19, as the famine continues, as the very severity of the famine continues, what do the people say? They say to Joseph, why should we die before your eyes, verse 19, by us? that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. Again, Webster's would tell us that that word means uninhabited, laid waste, a ruinous condition, neglected or destroyed. The people were seeing that. And they were pleading with Joseph that the land wouldn't become like that, desolate, destroyed, neglected, ruinous. Famine was severe. Now, hunger is not expressly mentioned here in the passage, but we have to think that if the famine was severe, there were hungry people, significantly hungry. That there wasn't a sufficient amount of food to to sustain the level of nutrition that they were accustomed to, especially following seven years of abundance. Verse 56 of chapter 41 tells us the famine was over all the face of the earth. And as Moses writes, he, wrote of, he writes of Egypt and of Canaan, and he gives us the idea that this is it. This is the world that's in view here over all the face of the earth, the world, all the people that this passage was concerned with were in the midst of a severe famine. The land was producing thorns and thistles, wasn't it? Previously mentioned that in another sermon. But isn't that what's happening? That Adam was told that as he sinned against God, what would happen? Well, the land would be cursed, and it would produce not an abundance, 
Not what you're used to. Not like the garden over here. Thorns and thistles. Cursed is the ground. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Why? Because of Adam's sin. Thorns and thistles were to be expected. So famine would also be expected. That was the norm. Then and now, because of our sin, anything else, meaning abundant produce, such as was in the garden, would be abnormal. Seven years of abundant produce in the land of Egypt was not normal. Now the seven years of famine, to be expected. Thorns and thistles produced as a result of Adam's sin, the prevailing effects of the curse. That's the backdrop. But what's the reality? God was merciful. That in his mercy, he sustained his people along with the Egyptians. There's a great focus here on what God did through Joseph. Either the name Joseph or a pronoun referring to Joseph or even the words my Lord were used 22 times in these verses. Moses wants us to know that, that God's servant Joseph was being used to sustain his people even in the midst of a severe famine. Joseph was using the gift of wisdom given to him by God to provide and distribute that which the people lacked, food, finally moving them into the cities where they could labor for Pharaoh. The Lord took this shepherd boy through much suffering to this place and position where his decisions or his wisdom saved the people of God. There may have been death, but Moses doesn't record it. There may have been those who died from starvation, but Moses doesn't record it. The only thing he records is that people survived. The only aspect that, that Moses records is that there was life, and it continued. Think of Psalm 37, verse 19. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. That's what was going on. Even in the days of famine, God was satisfying. The covenant was being fulfilled. Out of the famine came abundance. Look at verse 27. Everything up to this passage, 13, verse 13 through verse 26, is all about the famine and how severe it was. Then we get to verse 27. Israel dealt, dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen. And they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Not just a little. Exceedingly. In keeping with God's covenant promises. God's very words to Jacob were, Be fruitful and multiply a nation, and a company of nations shall proceed from you. And God went above and beyond and multiplied them exceedingly. You see what a great encouragement this would have been to the Israelites? As they were on the border ready to enter into the promised land, and as Moses was rehearsing with them the promises of God and, and even showing them, look, we'll see what he's done. Look and see what he did with Jacob. How even out of the midst of famine, then he multiplied the people exceedingly. They would have seen how God provides for his people, sustaining them even in impossible situations. And God does provide a way. There's a slow shift in this narrative from famine, from hunger, from being on the threshold of death to life. Slowly, the thought of famine fades from 
the minds of the Egyptians. And the reality of salvation comes into view. They're being saved from the thorns and the thistles. It comes slowly out of the shadows and then into the light of day. God snatched life out of what seemed to be certain death, that which captured the daily thoughts of the Egyptians and Jacob's family was slowly fading away. Hunger. Hunger was forgotten. Left behind in the goodness of God. In a seemingly impossible circumstance, God provided a way for life to be sustained through his servant Joseph at lowly shepherd boy who appeared to be on his way to living out his days in a dungeon suddenly becomes governor and savior of the land. God preserves his people. Canons of Dort provides this. Because of these remnants of sin, speaking of what, what resides within us, the old man, because of these remnants of sin dwelling in them, meaning us, and also because of the temptations of the world and Satan, those who have been converted could not remain standing in this grace, meaning the grace that God has given to us, if left to their own resources, but God. God is faithful, mercifully strengthening them in the grace once conferred on them and powerfully preserving them to the end. You see, that's what was happening with Jacob and his family. Through God's preserving hand, he enables Christians to forget hunger. Before he converted each one of us, we were in a state of hunger. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about our spiritual hunger. Like the famine which raged in Egypt and Canaan, we were spiritually hunger. Sin never satisfies. Lust is never quenched. No one is ever satisfied with things that do not pertain to God. The eye is never satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. You see, see how the Lord feeds us? How we were so hungry. And he satisfied that hunger. He does provide a way for spiritual life. Certainly here, the Lord provided a way for physical life through Joseph. But this is just a picture of what he does for spiritual life. We consider the situation in Egypt, Canaan to be perilous, to be dangerous, fraught with danger and death, then consider, brothers and sisters, your sin. The issue presented here was death by starvation. As we consider our sin, it's, it's death by the eternal wrath of God. Fire which cannot be quenched, that worm which does not die. Punishment we all deserve. Like the famine which which seem to ravage the entire civilized world. Sin ravages every single human being except Jesus Christ. This passage points us to Jesus, doesn't it? God provides a way. And Jesus is the way of salvation from sin. Jesus is the way from eternal wrath and death for all those who trust in him to life. Sin and death can and will be left behind. And the righteousness of Jesus has been wrapped around us. He indeed is the door. And it 
anyone enters by him, he will be saved. God provides a way in Jesus. Brings us to our second point, forgetting worldly things. Probably the majority of this text is fixed upon what Joseph did. But it's a striking description of what the Egyptians gave up. First it was money. Verse 14, Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan so they could buy grain. A dramatic way of stating that the people spent all of their money they had no more. The bank accounts were empty. The cans buried out back. Gone. Because of the severity of the famine, all of their funds, all of their monetary resources were spent. Given up. And when the money failed, and when the people were still hungry, Joseph said, give your livestock, your horses, your flocks, your cattle, your donkeys, everything, all animals given up. Not one left behind. And when the animals, the donkeys, the cattle, the flocks, the horses were gone, given up, the only thing left was the land. The land and their very persons. Buy us in our land for bread. And we in our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Joseph bought all the land. For every man of the Egyptians sold his field. I'm not sure Moses could have put this any other way to give us the clear understanding that they gave up everything. Nothing was left to the people. No more worldly possessions. Money's gone. Livestock sold. Land deeded to Pharaoh. Even themselves moved off of their land into the cities where they could now labor for Pharaoh. All worldly possessions, indeed even their individual freedoms, given up. Why? Why would they do such a thing? To live. Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? In other words, why should we die when you, Joseph, have the power to give us life, to save us? Buy us in our land for bread, that we may live and not die. Verse 25, so they said, you have saved our lives. Their worldly things, their worldly possessions, their freedom itself, it lacked value when they compared it to life itself. As they're faced with death, the value of money, the value of livestock, the value of land, even the value of their freedom was worthless. It's like they had no breath at all. Life became their all in all, everything given up so that they could have life. If they were willing to give up everything to have life and continue living, how much are we willing to give up to have Christ? It's quite interesting that these in Egypt gave up all their, all their possessions to have life and that Jesus tells us, that we must go actually one step further. That we must give up life itself to have life. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 16, verse 25. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Life, John 12, verse 25. And then that letter to the Philippians. 
after Paul has, has told them who he was, all of his accomplishments, all the boasting that he could do within himself, he says, I've counted it loss for Christ. I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. No, Jesus tells us that we must go one step further. Let me ask you, how do you lose your life? How do you count everything as rubbish to gain Christ? How do, you, how do you lose your life for the sake of Jesus? How do you hate your life in this world? It seemed almost natural to the Egyptians to give everything up. They were ready. First, first I think we all need to confess that we don't. I think we all need to confess that we hold so very tightly to the things of this world. I think we need to recognize that, especially in this country with so much prosperity. We Americans, we American Christians, have become lovers of this world, lovers of the comforts, the pleasures of this world. A powerful lie of Satan is that this world is all that there is to have. But the things of this world, this creation, are the things which provide ultimate satisfaction and enjoyment, not life with God. How did Satan tempt Eve? He set the fruit before her eyes. How did Satan tempt Jesus? With bread, with the avoidance of suffering, and with worldly kingdoms, the creation. Satan's greatest desire is that you love this world and creation so much that you neglect and turn away from God. To lose your life for the sake of Jesus is to unhand the world. It's to release your grip on the world and worldly things. It's to count as rubbish here the things in this world, all your accomplishments, all your belongings, indeed, your very self to set your mind on the things above. Say no to Satan as he offers you the riches of this creation and not the riches of Christ. And secondly, we need to remember and recall and meditate upon the greatest treasure of true life in Christ. We've died. Our life is hidden in Christ with God. And to lose your life for Jesus means to store up treasures in heaven, and that treasure is Jesus. And as you do, as you lose your life, indeed, you're building up that treasure in heaven. May the Lord help us to do that. Brings us to our third point, forgetting desolation. In this passage, if it has anything, it has many, many references to death. The thrust of the narrative is indeed death. That's the underlying problem, the backdrop, which is present throughout, step by step. The reader follows the plan of Joseph as it unfolds, and he is constantly dealing with the threat of death year after year, having to provide a new solution to the old problem, which has been the problem since Adam's sin in the garden. Nothing has changed, and that's death. So it's surprising. When it appears that the famine is over, when it appears that Joseph indeed has saved the people by and through his wisdom that's been given to him by God, and he's been placed there by God in order to do just that, as we get to that point, we think, well, the threat is gone. It's over. Indeed, we're told that the Israelites, the generations of Jacob, are growing and multiplying exceedingly. We think, hooray. Famish, the famine is been, has been vanquished. Death is no longer the problem, and yet it still is. Verse 29. When the time drew near that Israel must 
die. That's an interesting way for Moses to put what was happening. For Jacob must die. Death was still a problem. All of Joseph's plans, all of his work, all of his success didn't attain to eternal salvation. Didn't vanquish death. Jacob, here Israel, was about to die. So that helps us to focus our mind, doesn't it? Jacob had heard the word of God, who told him that he would go down with him to Egypt, and not only go down, that he would surely, meaning God, would bring Jacob back up. He listened, he heard, he trusted. And so now he's telling Joseph to take him back up up. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt. Jacob was emphatic. Even though Egypt was likely doing well, even though the family of Jacob was multiplying exceedingly, Jacob did not want to stay. You shall carry me out of Egypt. Why? Egypt represented the land of desolation, a land which languished. Well, that was back in the famine. Not really. Egypt was a land of idol worshipers. God was not sought after in Egypt. Yes, Egyptians had physically survived but were spiritually dead. The land of Egypt was truly uninhabited by worshipers of the living and true God. Egypt was dull. Egypt was feeble. It was spiritless. It was languishing. It was a desolate wilderness. But Canaan, Canaan represented the nearness of God. The land of promise, it represented the intimate communion and fellowship with God. I will be with you. That's what Jacob was told when he was called to return. God told him that he would be with him. Canaan would be made alive through the very near presence of God. Canaan represented restoration and reconciliation with God. And the Israelites who were on the border ready to to enter in, they needed to hear this. They needed to hear that, that Jacob wanted so much not to be in Egypt, but to be in the land of God. It would be Jacob's final resting place. In an earthly sense, he wouldn't be moved from that place. God himself would dwell with him there. That's where Jacob longed to be. Jacob was forgetting those things which were behind. And he was reaching forward to those things which were ahead. To a land which would not be desolate. It's interesting, the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 32, writes this, excuse me, 62. You, referring to the Israelites, referring to the people of God. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land any more be termed desolate. It's the same Hebrew word, the same root. Jacob's thoughts were on the things that lay ahead. He was reaching forward to his permanent dwelling, his eternal dwelling with the living God. What are you reaching for this morning? Where's your heart? Brothers and sisters, there are so many things in this world which, which cause us to keep our minds, our hearts here. Jesus says, no. Jesus says, forget those things which lay behind. You've died. Your life is hidden with Christ. 
why would you fix your minds upon these things? You've left them behind. You're with Christ. Fix your minds, your hearts upon that treasure in Christ Jesus. That's what he's calling out for us to do even this day. Reach forward to those things which are ahead. Jacob was doing it. The call this morning is for us to do the same. Yes, as the Spirit works, worldly lusts are left behind and the faithful reach forward to those things which are ahead. These parables give us an image, don't they? Those things which we might use to purchase that treasure, that pearl, not even given a second thought. Brothers and sisters, you've been given a treasure, that great pearl in Jesus Christ. Fix your minds upon him. Amen. Father in heaven, we ask now that you'd help us. We are weak, we are, we are feeble, we are frail, we're tempted. Lord God, continue to Uphold us in the righteousness of Christ. Continue, Father, to help us forget those things which lay behind and, and continue striving forward to those things which lay ahead. Help us to continue laying up treasures in heaven. Help us, Father, to fix our minds upon the things above, which is Christ Jesus and Him alone. We ask these things in His name.